Welcome to Norwegian Spitfire Foundation. This is NSF Talks. Hello and welcome to NSF Talks. NSF Talks is a series to dive deeper than ever before into the complexity of Norwegian Spitfire Foundation, our mission, and the various people that are involved in helping us achieve our goals. And that is to acquire, restore, operate, and maintain Spitfires. It's been a long time since our last podcast. Uh, My name is Knut Åsammer, and with me is uh, Tori Dar Larsen. And uh, we have been having these podcasts um, quite a few times now where we are, as said in the introduction, talking about the various activities that our foundation do. And one of them is also to talk about history and individuals uh, that are important to understand the context of uh, the air war, uh, both in Norway and uh, later when they were fighting abroad. And today we are going to talk about the invasion of Norway, 9th of April, 1940. Um, And as it's today uh, is only a few days from the historical date itself, we thought it quite fitting to talk about it right now. Uh, With me, I have Turi Dalarsen, and um, he has uh, gathered a lot of uh, stories of these seven pilots uh, who... uh, were on this fateful day writing history with their actions. Yep. So I can introduce you to the Larsen and welcome to NSF Talks. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's It's been a while. I think the last one we had was uh, in December. We were talking about Finn Torshager. S- yes, something just, along before, those lines. Just, just before New Year's uh, Eve, we talked about Finn Torshager. And once again, Finn Torshager is central in this uh podcast as well yeah uh, so you, you could say that this was part of our plan all along to uh just first talk about Finn Torshager and and because uh, we we did speak a little bit about uh Fornebu and uh 9th of April 1940 but you know it's it's a such such a you know vast subject so I think back then we moved on to his time with 331 and 332 squadron uh, so now we will be talking about these, you know, these events that happened, uh, especially around the Oslo area uh, and uh, the main airfield at the time, which was uh, was Fornebu. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I would like to just start immediately with um, uh, uh, with an, um, an important um, uh, a suggestion for everyone who is listening and who wants to know more about the full context of the Norwegian effort. Uh, Turi Dahl did about a year ago uh, have a presentation for the uh, military military aviation museum in Virginia and there he goes more in depth of the entire effort from the beginning uh, with 9th of April to the end of the war. Uh, so I highly recommend you to read and view that presentation. It's on YouTube and we will provide you the link to that uh, so you can enjoy this full co- uh, context of uh, of the Norwegian effort during the Second World War of the air crew and the ground personnel. Yes. Uh, Good, that's a good point. And since you're since you're on, you know, referring to podcasts and so on, I'll also refer to uh, Kato Gundfeldt's book about uh, Fornebu on the 9th of April, 1940, which is a, a massive uh, work uh, and one of those books that you know uh, have influenced me greatly because I was reading it when I was was you know a teenager and, and stuff like that. So so a, a lot of this comes from that book and it's highly recommended just uh, as a side note. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this uh, uh, Gunfeld is is sort of like the uh, he, he, he has established a lot of um, very important uh, groundwork for understanding the full context of uh, of uh, 
of the war in a sort of day-to-day -day basis through um, uh, in this example with the with the book uh, 9th of April at Fornebu it's it's short it's sort of minute by minute almost uh, where you have uh, the weeks prior to the invasion and uh, and then the, the hours and then the minutes and then the reports so it's very in-depth and mm -hmm. then he continues again with the Norwegian fighter squadrons uh, abroad uh, and telling it day by day. So I absolutely recommend you to uh, to look up uh, Carter Gunfeldt's books about the Norwegian pilots. We will move on to uh, the uh, subject of today, which is the 9th of April. The uh, it's you could say that uh, it has uh, a similarity to the Battle of Britain's uh, few, the uh, the fighter pilots who defended uh, Britain against an overwhelming invasion. Um, wouldn't you say that no, that in the situation on the 9th of April is very similar? Uh, yes, at, at you know uh, at that time uh, at that day. Uh, there are some similarities, and uh, when I started to put this, these stories online, I really wanted to draw that you know line between uh, the Battle of Britain and the few, and uh, Norway's few, uh, and they are you know quite few, and uh, it, it, everything happened. Well, I, I know that there were other uh, incidents uh, or, uh, in the air uh, elsewhere, uh, but. Uh, it's these, you know, these gladiators, these cluster gladiators, and those few pilots that you know have drawn my attention, and I'm sure others as well. So uh, yeah, I I wanted it to uh, to be like that. So so these are uh, our uh, few uh, to use uh, an English expression, you know, in terms of Battle of Britain. Yeah, and uh, it's also. It's it has many similarities, and then it also has some very um, how do you say um, unique feature uh, features that Norway has never been at war with another uh, nation in terms of uh, n no um, no uh, how you say offensives no no um, no um, no 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 fighting uh, abroad. Uh, so the, and this is. We had a small scrap with the Swedes, you know, uh, during our fight for independence. But, but uh, we've ne this is the first time we've been invaded. Uh, and and uh, how do you? The, how does a people prepare for? It? How were these pilots? Were they aware of the situation and what was going to happen and how things were unfolding? Since we're looking at this in hindsight in history, you know, what was. What was their view of the world at that time? Do you have? Do, did they? Do you have any recollections of that in your sources? Uh, well, uh, I would say that they they were aware uh, of what was going on in the 30s. Um, however, you know the uh, political situation, uh, you know, spoke of a different story, because you know, you can only look at the Gloucester Gladiator and you can tell that this is an outdated aircraft. And you can look at the other uh, aircraft that we had at the time, the the Fokker and uh, the, those Italian uh, uh, aircraft, and you you can tell that uh, you know defense and, and military uh, equipment and uh, wasn't you know on on anyone's agenda uh, until it was too late. Um, but I, I, yet I, I think these they weren't like unaware. Um, because you, you know you have Finn Tushagir and he 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 read uh, newspapers and, and aviation uh, magazines and and so so they had sort of a, a clue uh, whether or not they they expected to be invaded I don't know um, mm. but I'm sure as time progressed and we were going into 1938 and 39 uh, I'm sure they uh, expected something to happen but I. In naivety, I would say that uh, I think they expected us to remain neutral, like in World War One, because you know you, you sort of look to the, the past to find any you know similarities, and uh, you know how, uh, you know when you're in a new situation, and then you look to the past and you say, okay, we were we were neutral back then, and I'm sure that they will leave us alone this time as well. And so, yeah, it, you're you're yeah. sort of you're hoping for the best. So you're 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 
I mean, that was obviously we. I, I don't intend to go into detail about the politics, but that was uh, the hope that you could stay neutral by sticking to neutrality. So mm -hmm. if we don't, if we don't involve ourselves in anything, they want in. They we will stay out of trouble. Yes, yes, and <laughs> which is funny because you know you hear you hear certain politicians these days, and you hear the same rhetorics. Uh, you know, as long as we you know do not do anything and stay quiet, I'm sure nothing is going to happen to us. And it's been tried and tested, and it didn't work uh, back in 1940. And uh, you know, um, so they military-wise, they were unprepared. Uh, I, I would say they were yes. vastly unprepared, but so was like France and so was, you know, almost Britain as well. They were unprepared, uh, both materially and training and uh, and uh, resources as the government didn't apply a lot of uh, of, uh, of arming up the, the nation. But individually, do you know of any recollections of like practical things they did uh, the nights or the hours before the invasion? You had like uh, Finn Torsager, he was in neutrality service and you had uh, others too, uh, these people who had been through Harens Free School uh, and maybe, you know, during the 30s and maybe they've gone to something else like college or university and stuff like that. And uh, But they were, you know, called back in in the 19, in 1939 or, in or very early 1940 to, to serve neutrality and they flying reconnaissance and, uh, you know, but, you know, but... Uh, it, it wasn't that easy to keep these gladiators flying because they 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 cost money and there were you know serviceable issues and uh, but they they did try to keep somewhat of a force uh, in the air uh, during uh, that winter because you know the war was you know getting awfully close even though you know people you know being naive didn't really think but they 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 were trying their best and they uh, they had these these pilots. Um, living uh, out at Fornebu uh, in quite sparse conditions. Mm. Um, they were using these, uh, uh, how do you say it in English? You, uh, they had these tents, didn't they? Yeah, and they, they used this, you, you know, when you sort of grow, you know, plants and tomatoes and stuff inside during the winter and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we call it drivhus. Yeah, greenhouses. Uh, greenhouses. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So yes. they were sort of using uh, these, you know, ill-equipped and, and horrible uh, uh, places to, you know, to be a military force, which is like it's insane. Uh, yeah. Well, it's um, it's almost a repetition of what happened uh, on the on the continent uh, as they went through to to uh, to Belgium and. Uh, uh, and France uh, living in these tents in the in the in the dampness and everything that wasn't very good either. So no, no. no it, that's that's a small detail that probably many people for, tend to forget is the living conditions of an air base in war is very bad often since no, yeah. nothing is established. Yeah, uh, it, it was bad, and in Fornebu was actually an, an airfield, and yeah. you, you you would think that they would have you know proper living quarters for you know uh, a small uh, group of of fighter pilots trying to defend Norway, uh, mm -hmm. but apparently they didn't. Um, there is uh, more to this, uh, which I will you know, talk about in a while, but. Uh, should we just try to set like the stage here, Knut, for mm. uh, you know the you know the evening of a night uh, of eighth of April, uh, midnight and early hours in the morning of you know ninth of April, yes. and because uh, that's like from midnight until uh, the morning of ninth of April. That's what we're gonna you know that's mainly very... be talking about. That's uh, so we we've basically talked about the uh, the 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 uh, the foreplay here where we they know something's going to happen they don't know if they're going to be involved if the country is going mm. to be neutral or not so mm -hmm. they're doing their best with the small equipment they have the limited resource they have they do mm. reconnaissance flights and they their 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 job is to maintain neutrality in the air which basically means to stop any unknown aircraft mm -hmm. intruding into the airspace exactly which isn't that easy because uh, during that winter uh, there were um, more and more uh, reconnaissance aircraft of unknown origin flying over uh, oslo they heard them uh, they just weren't able to uh, catch them yes so, so you know, there were you know, you know signs of, of things to come. 
Yes, and that uh, we can definitely continue then with the the uh, the nine the night of eighth of April. So coming to the, the to to morning of ninth of April, the things started to happen. Yeah, um, just to, as a curiosity, like um, I because uh, these are things that you know when I read the book Kato did, uh, sort of like stuck to my mind and. You know, um, they uh, there was an air attaché from uh, from Germany. Uh, his name was Eberhard Spiller, and he lived just outside the airport. And it's it's you know it's it's quite sneaky, but you know it. I'm sure it's allowed. You know, but it, it's really like, it's really sneaky to on the 8th of April trying to invite top brass of the Norwegian Army Air Force for uh, dinner and you know. Drinking. Getting, getting them drunk <laughs> <Yeah>. to to <laughs> keep to keep them occupied while Germany is launching an attack force. It's basically conspiring against the nation you're attached to. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it must have been suspicious for the for the air air army staff as well or army air yeah. staff. M many of them said no to this invitation. Um, some of them, uh, you know, went and uh, one of them was uh, let fighter pilot Odd Bull, uh, funny name in English, because um, mm. he was there and he he did he notice. It bull. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he noticed uh, uh, that uh, Spiller was uh, often called to the back rooms to talk to uh, to Berlin, which he he found a bit you know mm. odd. Yes. Uh, and he I think he left uh, before midnight. Um, uh, so, so there were some top brass uh, present uh, there. Um, but, you know, the cheekiness of, you know, doing something like that is because he was supposed to meet uh, paratroopers uh, coming into Oslo uh, in the morning, uh, which didn't happen. But, uh, but that was that was his job just to keep them occupied and then meet, you know, an uh, invading force in at <laughs> Yeah, that's very cheeky. It's like trying to welcome to Norway with the welcoming party, sort of. Yeah. Yeah, very cheeky. So here's, I remember, here are the keys for the airport. Here, here's the keys, and you know I've been living here for quite some time, and you know, good luck, chaps. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, just to set the stage a little bit further, um, when when night fell and uh, you know uh, a fog started to, um, it, it was quite snowy um, back then as well. So because you know most of the time. Uh, around April, around Oslo, or in your parts, are you know, there's no snow; uh, it's yes. already gone. Um, but you can clearly tell for a, from any picture uh, from you know the early days of April that it was actually a quite a bit of snow around uh, Fornebu and Oslo at that time. So there was snow on the ground, um, and a fog came in from Oslo Fjord and and covered uh, Fornebu uh, during the night. So when uh, things started to happen. There were, uh, you know, uh, s some fog uh, going around. Um, I do think that the, the first uh, air alarms uh, uh, started to uh, go on around uh, just after midnight. Um, and so they were like, uh, I think that Finn and a few others, they slept at the restaurant uh, at Forna because there was like an <laughs> airfield restaurant. So. So that's where they 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 slept. Uh, yeah, so, still so on duty. They, yeah, and so he was. They were on duty and they were waiting for whatever to to happen. Mm, yeah. No, uh, that's um, that sets the stage. You know, a low incoming mist. It's it's sort of foreboding, foreshadowing, and what's going to happen. Mm. Because. Uh, during those early hours, and I, th I know that they were awakened uh, from their sleep around 1 a.m. Uh, and they heard some engine, an unknown engine sounds from from the air, and uh, they had uh, spread out all the gladiators around the airport in case of a bomb attack. And there were already, you know, messages coming in from the Oslo Fjords outer positions that uh, an unknown enemy were were intruding. Um, and I, I specifically, I remember this phone call, this mysterious phone call to one of these huts outside the perimeter uh, of Fornebu. Um, uh, someone called uh, with a Swedish voice saying that, you know, there were forces going north. Uh, and I think the guy... Yeah, they passed took... Malmö, wasn't it, or something? So yeah, they, and, and they the guy them. took that call and he was like, how did you get my number? Uh... <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is, you know, it is surprising when the Swedes uh, are obviously able to inform military quicker than their own staff. 
Yes, it's peculiar. It's quite yeah. peculiar, uh, you know, how, how things work. Uh, yeah. as, and which sort of just strengthens our point that they were vast, vastly unprepared for, for what was going on. Uh, you know, the, the, the most modern air force in the world were, were coming and they, you know, got messages from Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's uh, that uh, knowing how how um, unprepared or how unequal the the fight is going to become, it me it makes it even more uh, it makes it even more memorable to what they were able to do and their actions. Uh, yes, uh, because you know this is like a, a one uh, against ten. Uh, sort of yeah. situation in outdated aircraft against top modern aircraft. Um, top trained pilots who had top trained pilots. Oh yes, coming because these German uh, pilots uh, they had experience from Spain and uh, they had like uh, ME one one os and uh, they had Heinkel one one ones and 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 we we had uh, pre pre war Gloucester Gladiator. Uh, they could barely keep up in level flight with anything. They could, exactly, they could barely keep keep up in level flight with with a Heinkel. So, uh, God knows what they would think. But uh, yes, should should we just should we go uh, straight to the first the first uh, combat? Uh, yes, the first um, first contact. I guess the first con it. yes, the first yeah. contact because we've been discussing this before. I'm sure when we talk when we've talked about uh, Finn Tushagit, uh, because there were two of the gladiators that was they were told to to uh, go up. Uh, I think it was around 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, the fog was fog was over for Nabu. Um, Tushagit went first. Uh, Arve Bråten uh, came second, but he had some starter problems and they put in the wrong frequency tuned in between Torsager and Broten, so they had no contact. So that was the ground crew who did that, you think? that they... um, I, I don't know, probably. I don't know. Yeah. Who, who Interesting. Does? Yeah. They, it was like a misunderstanding about the frequency, so mm. uh, Torsager was sort of on, on his own. Um, yeah. And he was flying over the fog when he spotted this uh, dark aircraft uh, somewhere ahead. Um, it was a uh, two engine aircraft with twin rudders and uh, I think he saw the German crosses on the wings after uh, a while and he realized that this was uh, not uh, not any uh, this was an intruder and this and they have been preparing for this this is this must have been as we just talked uh, in the beginning that they must have known this could possibly happen mm -hmm. so they mentally they still have to go ahead and do their duty and press on with the attack. Yeah, uh, must be difficult when you never ever done something like this in your life. No, uh, um, I don't know. I'm sure he 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 spoke about you know being guilty uh, about you know shooting at the, or attacking this this unknown aircraft because you sort of you have to know what you're doing because what if you're you're you know shooting someone you're not supposed to shoot. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe this, uh, maybe it is a, 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 an aircraft that was just coming astray into Norwegian airspace. Maybe it, it didn't have a ill intent, but you don't mm -hmm. know, and you still have to make a decision. Yeah, and and he he thankfully made the right decision in opening fire, but um, uh, it I, I don't know. It must have been you know. Uh, something to decide in a split second because yes. you know you just have to go for it and he did so he went in for an attack and he um, I think he opened fire on just a little bit too far out uh, he, he didn't get close enough and you know you're inexperienced and you you don't wait uh, long enough until you you fire uh, we we experienced this when we fly uh, uh, simulations. We yeah. we we uh, we do not. You have to wait until you fire. You always of... start a mile away, and then after <laughs> maybe two or three years of playing, you finally get down to 150 yards if you're very lucky. Right, right exactly. And he did the same mistake. He fired from way out. Uh, so he, there, there were no, but they did notice that he was firing. These Germans, they noticed him. So they, they just, you know, went under the, the cover of fog, and then, but they didn't really know where, where they were. Uh, for what they knew, they could, you know, crash into a mountain if they just kept on flying in the blind. So they had to go up again. And when they went up, he went 
down for another attack and, and so on. It went for like three times, I think. Yes. And uh, do you uh, do um, do we have a, this was a single lone aircraft? So, mm -hmm. so that sounds for me like that's almost like a, a, a forward scout, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. And this is pro this is, someone has written this. Uh, I think Kato did that. The that there was a scout attachment just to check the conditions, the weather conditions. Is mm -hmm. it possible to land at Fornebu, or do we have to parachute? And mm -hmm. this decision was eventually made to land. Mm -hmm. So this was probably a scout plane. Most most likely a scout to check out the conditions. Uh, and since there were aircraft, uh, air, you know, in the air around 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. or something, uh, you, you had like uh, German aircraft flying over to check on the conditions. Uh, so yeah, that, that it was a scout. I'm sure it was a scout. So yeah, you're, you're right about that. So he returned uh, to uh, to Fornebu and mm. basically announced to everyone that Norway is at war in the terms of we don't know. May, do you know if he knew it was German? But at least you knew that uh, neutrality had been broken. Yes, neutrality had been broken, and I have a feeling. Just, this is just speculation, but I have a feeling that he knew it was German. Um, but he, he, there was also some, some talk about uh, a bullet hole uh, in his gladiator. Um, so he might have been uh, shot upon by, uh, by this intruder as well. So, uh, but he knew that uh, this was some serious stuff when he, uh, when he came back uh, to Fornebu from his uh, first flight. And that was the first time uh, someone opened fire in the air, uh, you know, in hostility. Yeah, first time ever in Norwegian history they fire in anger in the air. Yep. Uh, of course, that maybe that was going through his mind at that moment. But you have to move on quickly, and things was probably a rush. Then, uh, what happened next? The, uh, what did the command do next at Fornebu? Well, uh, they were starting to get uh, messages uh, that 15 aircraft or more had been uh, spotted passing Malmö off the coast of Sweden, going north. Uh, but uh, Captain Erling Muntedal, he was, uh, was he station commander at Fornebu or he was in command of the, well, he, he had he had some uh, important position at Fornebu, at least. Yeah. And he was not quite convinced that, you know, these aircraft were going to Oslo, but he thankfully decided to send the gladiators up just in case. So, uh, and then they... Um, he uh, told it was actually uh, Rolf Torbjörn Tradin who was leading uh, these gladiators going uh, up in the air, uh, you know, as a uh, and he brought uh, five others. No, and he was one of the, one of the fives. Yes, and and what this was all they could manage, right? They mm -hmm. they they didn't have any more aircraft that was ready. They had two more aircraft that was not ready at the time. So they had they sent up everything they had, which was yes. five aircraft. So so these are the guys we're talking about. This is um, Tr Tradin. Um, it's Per Wåler. Uh, it's Finn Torsager, Christian Fredriksson, and Dag Kron. Uh, but left behind is Arve Bråten. Because uh, he was waiting for his gladiator to be ready for another sortie, because he was back in the back on the ground, and then you had uh, a seventh pilot, Oscar Albert Lutkin, uh, who was also waiting for his gladiator to be uh, to be ready. So in total, seven pilots in, yeah. ready for battle. You had uh, seven pilots ready for battle, uh, five in the air in a V-shaped formation uh, going south, uh, and then you had two ready to uh, take off. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and that is what they're going to face an invading armada of initially it was something like 50 or 60 aircraft in the first mm -hmm. wave. Yeah, there was a lot more than 15. Uh, they were they uh, 50. reported. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, there was a lot, lot more because uh, they, mm -hmm. they got a report of 15, but there were like 50 to 60. There was, yeah. it's, it's an, an, a whole armada of, of German aircraft coming their way, which was a batch of Heinkels and Messerschmitts uh, 110s and uh, some transport craft. Uh, but no, uh, no Messerschmitt 109s because, you know, the range sort of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The um, and the and the, it, that that site must have uh, you know I wonder what they thought if if their stomach dropped and their their sort of uh, heart raced up in into their chest when they realized that 
all of that is hostile. <laughs> all of that is hostile, and they understood it uh, because they, uh, I think, Tradin got his order that an attack by an air force was expected against Oslo while it was in the air. They were told to uh, patrol over Nesodlande. Uh, they were circling, and then this German armada showed up. Underneath them, they appeared. Uh, and from what I understand, uh, talking to them and 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 reading, um, they just gave up counting them. There were so many of them. Yeah, and I, and I, that's probably why uh, Tradin said that famous words for us who are into hmm. this history is. Every man for himself, good luck. Yeah, every man for himself and good luck. So uh, there is no point trying to attack individual aircraft or try and organize something. We are we are a few gladiators versus an army. Mm -hmm. So we have to do the best we can in yeah. this moment. So just just find a target and, and fire. That that's it. Just just find a target and, and do what you can. Yeah. 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 And, and, and then uh, you have uh, Arve Bråten, which he, he was a bit delayed, uh, and he he made this uh, also quite you know famous remark to his ground crew. I don't know if you know it. Yes, I, I read it. <laughs> <laughs> Very understated. Yeah. You, you, you go ahead. You can do it. You can. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he uh, he uh, he uh, he uh, he since he was delayed, and uh, he. Uh, he he saw all the orders go off. I'm pretty sure he had some time to think about. He had some more time to sort of dwell on what is about to happen. So he pointed at his car and said, "If anyone wants my car, it's over there." Yeah, that sort of that that sort of means that he realized that what was going on. He understood because if he thought that they were just going on a reconnaissance sortie, that's not something you would tell uh, your ground crew. I would assume at least that. Maybe uh, this was because he knew that something uh, very bad was going to happen. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a very well, it's a very yeah, it's a very good uh, statement of the time of the situation and the mindset they were in at that time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, we can we can talk a little bit about each pilot's. Uh, uh, you know, experience yes. uh, during uh, you know that you know melee over uh, over Oslo. Yeah, uh, I guess we can con begin just for chronological reasons. We can begin with the leader, so Rolf Torbjörn Tradin. He he yep. led the the formation of five. Mm -hmm. He ordered everyone to uh, attack uh, on their own and wish them good luck. Uh, so how how did how did it go for Tradin? He went in for several attacks. Um, he, um, but he experienced that, you know, when he went in for an attack, uh, they just went for the clouds, uh, the Germans. So yes, and, and the they, clouds were below them, right? They were, they were below flying, them. Yep. They were flying above the clouds because low mist, and we know this mm. in Norway. There's always a lot of low mist in in springtime and winter time. Uh, so they just flew into the mist to, yep. to in cover. Yeah. Yeah. But he did went in for several attacks and. Uh, and he remarked that uh, he felt it was quite easy to get away from uh, any uh, fire at him because you know they were firing with tracers. So he just felt he could you know you know you know turn away from the attacks quite easily. Do you uh, think that there there was some reluctancy on the German side as well to attack to return fire to the Norwegians when they saw they were coming in these ancient devices you know ancient well, aircraft? Considering what they had been told, because I think some of them or all of them had been told that they were sort of just, you know, coming to protect us from the British, you know, it's it's all propaganda, uh, you know. So they, so I think that some of them were quite surprised when they were met by uh, five outdated uh, British cluster gladiators just going for it. Yes, because uh, I don't think uh, they were prepared for. You know, and I think some of the, these German, I'm not sure if they, you know, the, the pilots, but some of the soldiers were saying like, why, why are you firing at us? Because, you know, uh, exactly. Yeah, we, we they, come to, they, they were told they would, you know, come to, it's, it, you know, like I said, it's all propaganda. Yeah, they were, they were up, they were told that uh, this was a liberation campaign yeah. to save us from the British, which were going to invade us. Or at, at some point, I'm sure they would, they, they would be, uh, you know, trying to secure the, 
some of the natural resources that we had. But you know, uh, so they so they were going for you know, uh, you know that sort of propaganda, and then they everyone bought it. So, um, but that was that was Stradin, and he uh, after a while his machine gun malfunctioned, so uh, he had to abort it, uh, abort the fight, and he landed at uh, Steinsfjord. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that is, but I'm sure it's somewhere in the vicinity of Oslo. Do you know where well, it is? Uh, no, not not uh, not at the top of my mind. Uh, the uh, the reason he, he didn't go back to Fornebu was that the Germans had already started attacking the airfield, haven't? Yeah, didn't yeah. they? Because uh, some of them were told to to not come to Fornebu and do not land because as we're uh, going into some of these uh, these other pilots, uh, you will understand that. Uh, one of the gladiators will be shot up. I think that's. Uh... I guess we can we can go straight to to him. Oh yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, Pierre Waller, uh, he has uh, quite remarkable. He was uh, he was interviewed uh, by uh, by documentary uh, several documentaries. So where he talks about his encounter. So uh, if. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting. He he closed in as close as he could. So so as Finn Tushage did, uh, or as in the beginning, he opened up very far away, and uh, perhaps perhaps uh, he, he was discussing with the other crew, uh, with the other pilots, and uh, and Pierre he waited to open fire until he was like mm-hmm. could see could see the entire cockpit or entire windscreen just covered with wing with mm-hmm. the entire aircraft so like 100 and 150 meters or 200 yards or so and then mm-hmm. closed in all the way into 50 yards and then that aircraft almost like the wing engine just burst into flame and mm. it spiraled die, down and crashed into the uh, ocean uh, into the Oslo fjord mm-hmm. uh, so that must have been quite spectacular to be that close uh, and sort of yeah war comes to you suddenly very personal and yep. and Pierre wasn't really a he wasn't really a like a fighting guy like an aggressive guy he he wanted to study was it uh, social economics and he had a high ac- academic background mm-hmm. i don't yeah. really think he was like a you know aggressive fighter person no uh, i i met Pierre Wallet and uh, he did not strike me as a very aggressive uh, kind of guy but i don't yeah. think any of them you know you were um no but it's just like you say uh he waited uh and he fired very close and he uh more than likely got that heinkel um uh, and yes. he he um he went to fornebu um and he landed his uh, gladiator um and he wanted to keep the engine running just you know to rearm and refuel and go back up uh, but then you know you had several 110s coming in over the airport, so uh, his so he had to run away from his uh, gladiator. And um, about 20 meters behind him, he heard projectiles uh, hitting the ground, and the gladiator was set on fire. That is very close call. Since that is are, very close. I mean, uh, as a, as a pilot, but not in any way to uh, to um, to. Um, to, to to similar to a gladiator since in, you know i am i'm a pilot uh, i only have an easy harness to get off but he ha- he he has a, a harness over his shoulders needs to get all the straps off he needs to open the cockpit needs to climb out it's very tall it's very impractical and he needs to crawl down and get away all that in what 10 seconds or something mm-hmm. yeah it's yeah he got away that was very very fortunate yeah, I think Pedro was uh, he was very lucky at that point, uh, but he did you know very well during this uh, brief encounter with uh, German forces. And uh, and then you have uh, Dag Krohn. Um, he uh, he also went in for uh, for an attack. He uh, he said he saw one of them, uh, Anna Heinkel, go uh, vertically just straight down just south of Fornebu. Um, but when he uh, tried to follow it, he was attacked by two ME one one Os. Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, he he uh, he saw them, or I mean, he he uh, he uh, he he. You've tried to follow the one he was he he, he shot shot at, mm. and then he got attacked by another pair of one one Os. And it's uh, as you, uh, almost all of all of the these uh, gladiator pilots. They were attacked by several 
swarms or several pairs of one one oh so hmm. there must have been so many all, all of you left right up down sent i mean the chaos must have been yeah. total there was no way of have any unit cohesion there's no way that these gladiators could have cooperated in any way since there's too many enemy aircraft around you to keep a lookout for so Chaos. Yeah, so you can you can you can go in for an attack and then you get three others on you and you have to abort your attack and you can find another uh, to attack and then you get three or four more on your tail and you know so it goes. Uh, you're just so outnumbered. Um, yeah. uh, but he re made some remarks uh, later on that he had uh, attacked a uh, Heinkel and uh, uh, I think he must have thought or or felt that uh, he he had injured or killed uh, one of the machine gunners because uh, the machine gun suddenly went quiet and pointing upwards. So mm. uh, maybe he uh, was just hiding in that, you know, in in, uh, in that Heinkel, but maybe he, he was, you know, killed. Uh, and yeah, he pressed on the attack on that Heinkel mm. that, that lost the, the rear gunner and mm -hmm. spent all his ammunition or, or at least did everything he could on that, on mm. that aircraft. And then that aircraft disappeared into the mist again, descending, mm -hmm. spiraling. And you don't see it anymore. You don't want to go down into that mist since the ground is right below you. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, he but he also landed at uh, Stain Steward uh, just after that uh, that battle. Uh, so, and then we have we've talked about three. There's several. There's more to come. Uh, we talked about Finn last time. Um, he was yeah. a bit unlucky uh, during this uh, second encounter of his because um, his uh, guns froze. Uh, they got jammed. Yeah, uh, but he he had gained some experience, so he did wait a little bit longer before he fire, opened fire, uh, and he did see some black smoke coming out of the bom uh, bomber's engine, and uh, but it also disappeared into the clouds. So uh, yeah, so that was uh, it. It's uh, just to, as we said, we are, we have uh, as we said, we there are the the superiority of the German aircraft in numbers and speed and. And uh, and also the weather is sort of working against defense because mm. they can just fly into mist and escape and and uh, yeah it's everything happens very quickly. Exactly. So uh, in in all that you know confusion and uh, you know his guns jamming and uh, so he decides to go back to Fornebu to fix the problem. Uh, but when he came back there, there were several fires on the ground because uh, I'm sure Per Waller had already landed. Uh, and then uh, two Messerschmitt 1010s uh, attacked him from the rear. Uh, so he uh, got away, luckily, got away from uh, from uh, his attackers and set course for Kjellir, which is to the north. Uh, but at Kjellir, there was more of the same fire and chaos on the ground. So he turned around, tried to fly back to Fornebu. Uh, but that was unsafe, uh, so he decided to uh, land his gladiator at uh, Mjärvan in Erbak, yeah. and that was it um, for that gladiator. I guess it's also worth to mention that, uh, no, I, I don't know on top of my head what the endurance is of the gladiator, but I cannot expect it to be any more than one hour and a half, maybe one hour, 20 minutes. So yeah. they, they, they spent half an hour flying south, and they've been fighting, and then they spent maybe 20 minutes to come back up to vulnerable and then uh 10 minutes more to to shell it so they maybe they have maybe at best they have uh 20 half an hour minutes of fuel left what are you going to yep. do you, you you have to land somewhere yeah what are you going to do and when there's no you know runways to use anymore and there's two airfields around like what are you going to do thank you know thank god for some frozen lakes uh to put your aircraft uh, down yeah uh, which is what he he did so for Finn's sake, that was that was it for 9th of April 1940. Um, he, uh, you know, the conditions at that uh, lake wasn't the best. So he uh, he managed to taxi his glider to to the shoreline, and he took the I think he took the bus back. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, also uh, uh, we should I, I'll come back to it, but I would like to know what these pines did after they landed, since fortunately they all survived. Uh, but it is sort of bizarre to think what they had to do after they mm -hmm. the, the fight, since things are so bizarre then. Uh, yes, uh, we we talked about Finn now. She, uh, yeah. uh, Christian Fredrik She, uh, mm -hmm. he has probably the most uh, exciting, if you could say, but mm -hmm. at least the most difficult uh, yeah. fight. That was that uh, was very that was very dramatic stuff. 
uh, yeah. he, he he came very close to to die because um, like the rest he he went into the fight uh, over Nesodlana. Uh, he attacked several of them uh, while he kept an eye out and you know he felt like he he had some poor vis- visibility in his cockpit and he went lower and he pumped up fuel to the windscreen to clear his uh, vision and uh, he managed to create some better sight for him and he spotted one one os he uh, half rolled it downwards to to those germans and he opened fire and he kept firing i'm sure he opened fire uh, just a tad too early uh, to get some good results uh, but he he shot one down one of those me one one os uh, so that uh, that aircraft rolled over and spiraled down, and uh, it's pretty impressive yeah. to think that he is he is. Uh, I mean, his situation is pretty difficult since he's okay. Already, he has low visibility in his cockpit, so that creates a high workload and high amount of stress. He tries to clean his vision, but and he descends, and when he finally gets vision again, he sees he's got two <laughs> ones one one zeros behind him. Uh, so he has to do something very quickly now, uh, and he just cuts the throttle and rolls over and dives straight down and gets on the tail of one of them and shoots it down, yeah. almost from, almost from a vertical attack. I mean, you don't you don't train for this. Everything happens extremely quickly, and you don't see anything in the Gladiator. That big wing is in the way, mm-hmm. so he had right. to improvise very quickly. But you know, how how many you know Gladiators managed to shoot down Messerschmitt one one O's? Yeah, uh, that that's you know that's that's uh, that's that's skill in its own. Yeah, uh, you have this you know this this uh, this gladiator and you're going in for a really modern Messerschmitt 110 and you manage to shoot it down. Yeah, and the only way you can do it is to su- surprise. If you surprise, you know you have to be the one first to attack. Yep, uh, and managed to do it and it spiraled away. Uh, but of course there was his friend, his wingman was there and. He was now on him. Yeah. Then uh, there were more. There were more yes, Germans more, coming in. More coming in too. <laughs> more coming in. So uh, and then he was attacked from the rear, uh, and he is hit. Uh, he uh, he's hit in his arm. Uh, so he uh, he sort of loses just his. You know, he can't move his arm anymore. Uh, he can't use his arm to to do anything. It's just you know, it's the arm is completely dead from from the impact by these bullets. So he's bleeding, and he uh, he contemplates, to, you know, jumping out. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and now he's in in real trouble because he he's injured and he's he's got a message mid one one also on him his back. Uh, so he's trying also to land his gladiator at a frozen lake. Um, you know, but when you approach the lake, you sort of need both hands, you know, both arms to do yeah, stuff. Yeah, you you need to reduce throttle. You need yeah. to lower flaps. You need to work with the left hand. Everything is on your left hand, uh, and no, it's it's numb. It's useless to you. Yep. So he yeah. overshot. He overshot yeah. that, uh, and he he crash landed in a field close by. Um, yeah. yeah. So he's still in the cockpit, and when the gladiator came to halt, come to halt, and the engine starts to smoke, and uh, but he managed to pull himself out of uh, out of the aircraft. With so, one hand, yeah, or one with, arm. With one hand, yeah. So so yeah. he's he's you know injured, but uh, thankfully he uh, he he uh, survived uh, the attack. Yeah. Uh, and th- there is a photo, and I think I'm going to post it on the Facebook page uh, during this uh, month. But you know, you can see him in front of the. Uh, the gladiator uh, w- with his arm, you know, in uh, bandages and, uh, you know, standing in, in front of it. So because he, yeah, he was back into civilian clothes. Yeah, again, the absurdity of, of uh, you know, suddenly he's there, uh, then under occupation, if I remember correctly. So he, so back in civilian clothes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. We have uh, there is one left though who uh, you know yeah. um, we can we, we we can do Oscar uh, Oscar Albert Lutkin first because he he had to simply just had to turn back due to a, a bad engine and he got a flat tire on landing and and then it was attacked so uh, that was uh, you know quite botched for him. Yeah, he was not able to make any contact with the enemy and uh, he had to just return to the field straight away. And when he did so, he, he, his aircraft got attacked. But do do we do we know anything about uh, what uh, was he in around the aircraft or was he pr- trying to get the new aircraft? Since if I remember correctly, there were no other gladiators that were, well, the, no, were prepared. They, no, nothing was left to to do for him. So. Yeah. 
and uh, I honestly, on top of my head, um, not sure what happened uh, at, after he left his gladiator. Um, but then you also have Arve Bråten, and his gladiator wasn't working well either. So, uh, but he decided to just to press on, uh, attacking. And he was flying alone. Since, yeah, he was flying as, alone. As we said earlier, uh, uh, Tradin led the formation with five, mm-hmm. including himself, and then Bråten and Lutke was supposed to uh, to join them later. Uh, and then uh, Lutke continued to have uh, engine problems, so he was delayed further, but Broughton managed to go on a bit earlier. So he went into battle alone. That must have been scary too, just in, that was, yeah. as we talked about earlier. Uh, he, he had made up his mind already. So. Oh yeah, that, was, that must have been quite scary. Uh, he went in for uh, an attack on a Heinkel uh, 110. Um, Managed to do some uh, damage on it, um, uh, but when he uh, he had to uh, turn sharply because he was being attacked, uh, and when he uh, completed that turn, the, the German was too far away. So, uh, Broughton also landed his aircraft at uh, Alec because uh, he also saw there were burning aircraft at uh, Fornebu at that time. So he understood that that was no place to be, and that was it. Uh, that was that. That was what the gladiators managed to do. But when you come to think of it, they managed to shoot down a uh, Luftwaffe aircraft, and that's a pretty good feat. Absolutely. Just uh, to not have uh, the opportunity to do. They 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 were thrown into a situation without much possibility to do anything else. They they only had these handful of aircraft, and uh, they had. And in huge invasion armada in front of them, and they had no other choice but to press on the attack and make, do the best they could with what they had, mm. and they were able to to do that. Uh, for me, it's just uh, with just thinking that uh, the 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 courage that they had is immense, and they must have just steeled themselves in. They must have come into a, a mental state where they will just keep all the emotions away and, and do as best as they can. And it, it, this probably only lasted for what this this entire battle lasted for 15 minutes. Yeah, not that minutes. long, not that long. 10 minutes maybe. Yeah. Mm. And with the gladiators gone, um, for some odd reason, no one had the idea of, you know, what if you like put a transport of some sort in the middle of a runway? You can't land there. Uh, but what happened was that, you know, the Germans, you know, um, they were short on fuel and they started to land. Uh, and when the the Heinkels and the Messerschmitts were coming into land, there were some machine guns, you know, firing at them, Norwegian machine guns firing at this, this landing Luftwaffe aircraft. Uh, but they stood no chance because, you know, mm. uh, some of them, you know, crashed when they landed. But, you know, with that amount of aircraft, you know, they uh, and... It wasn't even supposed to be because it was supposed to be, you know, taken by paratroopers. So it was like alternative plans in invading a country. And so they, in, the Air Force sort of invaded Oslo because Blücher was, you know, down in, in the lake. I mean, in the fjord. So, um, yeah, it all, it, it became sort of, if I remember correctly, the, the uh, it was a sort of a decision on the fly to, to, to land. Uh, and uh, it, caused a lot of chaos uh, since there was not space for 50, 50 Junker 52s to land on Fornebo. No. Massive chaos, massive chaos. Uh, and uh, so, so things uh, should have gone better, but you know, in, in hindsight, uh, the pilots at least did uh, what they could. They, you couldn't really uh, expect much more uh, of uh, seven gladiators, you know, no. minus one, you know, six gladiators uh, going into battle like that. Uh, yeah, it really is. It really is, it shows the, the spirit of their name, the, the fighter wing. They yep. they did their duty, in right, regardless yes. of the of the odds. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, uh, as time progressed, that you know they uh, uh, going back to Spiller, the cheeky uh, air attaché. Uh, he was killed uh, the day after, tenth of April. Uh, in the uh, Hamar area, uh, where the Germans were facing uh, some resistance from Norwegian forces. Uh, so that didn't go well for him. Um, and then you had all these pilots. I, I, don't, I don't know like exactly to the detail what they were doing uh, 
uh, you know, the, in, the, in the days after the the invasion and the dogfight. Uh, I know that Finn Torshagir, he uh, came down with pneumonia. So, uh, yes. so he, he was out. Uh, he had to stay in bed because pneumonia was, uh, you know, serious stuff back then. So, so he had to stay in bed uh, until it was, you know, better again in July or August 40. And then he escaped. Uh, yeah. yeah, and she he he was taken to hospital, wasn't he? She was taken to hospital. Um, he um, let's say, Christ. No, I I hadn't written anything about that, but uh, he was taken to hospital and he uh, stayed. I think he stayed with the resistance for a good while before uh, he became an instructor at Little Norway. That was on top of my mind, so I'm, uh, I can't really say 100%. But he became a doctor after the war. So basically, uh, did any of these pilots fly again during the campaign, during the uh, invasion of Norway? Did they oh, flee anywhere to it's fly a good, again? It's good question, because Dag Kron took uh, his gladiator to Hamad. Um, and I think they you know, were planning to use that gladiator as part of the defense, but uh, it didn't really work out for them. Uh, but uh, all of the other gladiators were 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 gone. Uh, no, they uh, th- you know there were some flying up north and uh, with some fuckers and, uh, and and stuff like that. But uh, as far as I know, and I'm sure someone will correct me, uh, there were very little uh, flying on left uh, for these guys uh, at that time of uh, of the war. Yes, and. Uh... I think that ends it very well. Uh, if you would like to hear again more about what their stories, how they continued their stories, uh, we will link the presentation Twilida did uh, about the Norwegian effort of the ground crew and pilots that fought abroad uh, that he presented to the uh, Aviation Museum of uh, Virginia, where right. you can get the entire length of the war and get in more in context because some of these guys they fled and they they fought with the royal air force um including uh tradin and tushagir and uh, there's one story though i i i have to uh, i have to do because you know uh, norwegians they have a, you, you heard of jantelov you're not supposed to yeah, think yeah. you're anything uh, special uh, it's and very, that's the, it's very important that you don't uh, that you don't uh, boast of what you do. A- any anything that shows achievement is frowned upon. It's basically yes. Yes. you have you have to think uh, you, you're not supposed to think outside everyone else's way of life. So if you are right. different, that's bad. Yes, right. So uh, the story goes that uh, they had a party at Little Norway. Uh, you know, in the early days of uh, Little Norway when. Um, uh, these uh, fighter pilots from 9th of April served as instructors. And I think this is Tradin. Uh, it could be uh, someone else. It's at definitely one of the uh, the pilots from 9th of April. And he, uh, whatever, whoever it was, he was he was bragging uh, or, or telling the story, at least. I'm not sure if he's bragging about it, but, you know, they were drinking and he was telling the story about his heroics of, of 9th of April 1940 because he had something that none of these other guys had, and that was combat, real combat experience. So uh, that was at the time when uh, one of the other pilots also trained at Tjeller before the war, but he had no uh, combat experience at that time. I think his name was Arne Ousten, and I know him quite well. Uh, but the guy who wrote that story uh, did not specify the name of the guy who did this, but um, I remember calculating my way uh, forward to that this was Arne Ousten. But he took, uh, you know, a champagne cooler, uh, you know, with ice, <laughs> <laughs> so he so he took that champagne cooler and he 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 spilled that you know by, on his neck. Yeah, <laughs> poured it cool down his down. neck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. It's a horrible practical joke, and I, I'm not sure if anyone you know they really appreciated that. But uh, he was a bit of a practical joker like that. So. <laughs> you're not, you're yeah. not supposed to brag about you know fighting yeah, the, the Germans. <laughs> No, no. So time to cool down. Cool down now. Yeah, yeah. yeah time yeah. to cool down now. So yeah, yeah. And uh, just, just you know, to to close this, Knut. Uh, we uh, this is April, and it's 9th of April soon, and um, there are lessons to be learned here. 
uh, for the future and for the present with the Ukraine. Uh, and so uh, what this, you know, teaches us or me at least is that we have to be prepared because they were unprepared. They should have been prepared uh, for an invading force. They weren't because they, you know, naively sort of believed in peace and which is fine. Uh, but, you know, there were signs, more than signs uh, in Europe in the 30s that this wasn't really going the way, right way. Um, so, so there are, you know, clear uh, experience to take uh, from a story like this and whatever those young guys had to, you know, do because, you know, if they had been unlucky, they would all would have, you know, died in that combat. Uh, thankfully, they, they also survived, uh, but it could have gone worse and they were so unprepared for what was coming. Yes, I, I think, I mean, the, the parallels are, there are parallels with the situation in Ukraine. And I think that it's important that we remember the stories of these uh, of these pilots and as young people who decided to to make a difference and do a, do make a, do their duty and in the unknown even when they were in, unprepared they decided to 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 stay be steadfast and continue fighting and uh, they moved abroad, they traveled all across the world, they trained in little Norway, and they came back to uh, reclaim their country again, as right. free. Yeah, right. And uh, yeah, we must not forget such stories of people. It doesn't matter uh, if, um, uh, it doesn't matter that this story is old and is uh, we don't have any living veterans of this uh, time any longer but that's why it's even more important to remember their sacrifice and their efforts since mm. it doesn't come from anywhere they have to make a decision and they have to make a stand and yep. they did yeah and you know you, you say it's you know if you know long gone and sure uh, you know it's 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 over 80 years ago uh, but it, I've come to realize that uh, history is closer to us than we we mm. might think, uh, especially now with Ukraine. And you see how these Russian forces use the same sort of tactics as they did during uh, 1945 when they were going into Berlin uh, and, and going into Germany. It's So we've come some, you know, you come far, but maybe not that far. Um, yes. And... Uh... Another reason I think it's important also to remember this history or try to find the truth in history is that as these uh, these uh, Norwegian pilots and the fighter wing is a is a is a it's a way as a symbol for Norway, but it's also a symbol of uh, a democracy defending its own rights to be sovereign, to be independent, right. uh, and the aggressor which was nazi germany here yeah, but it can also be anyone is decided that we have a better opinion of what we want this country to be and we're going to liberate you uh, and and all of this means that uh, they you we, that country doesn't respect the sovereignty of another country so and uh, so it's all very important that these pilots they decided that no our 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 independence is uh, worth fighting for and they are they did fight for it and continue to fight for it and yeah. fortunately they survived but even if they if they wouldn't have uh, they still decided to to make that choice right yes because uh, when you know what freedom is uh, you fight for it um, I think there was another pilot who wrote something like that to his uh, to his mother uh, I think I used it as a quote in a in a book yeah, uh, I, I could, do not remember the name of him, but I do remember he, the context. Yeah, because he said something like, uh, I don't care whatever happens to me as long as I have fought for freedom. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, uh, because I have seen what oppression uh, means. Um, I think one of the, it, it was a young guy and I think he was killed over Cambridge by a lightning strike in a, in a Spitfire or something like that. So so I think that was, it's, it's very well summed up uh, what these guys were going up against. So. Uh, lessons to be learned, uh, and we're closer to history than we might uh, might think. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. That's it, Knut. That is uh, a very good way to end, and uh, 
I hope you, everyone here, have enjoyed listening to me and to Ridar. It's uh, been uh, nice to go back to these, um, to go back in depth to to uh, read on these these personal stories of these people and uh, their actions and their decisions. Yeah, and the question now is, what will we do next? We have to discuss that. We can continue with the. Um, we were going to to continue with other profiles, so. We could do could life be. in Sten next. Yes, could be our favorite topic. Yes. Could be we're going down the path of life in Sten. That would I be ha- fun. I have to I have to visit you and uh, Tore uh, soon anyway. Uh, so to get a bit more, I have to fly that Spitfire soon again. I miss yeah. that Spitfire pit very much, and uh, I think it's a great opportunity to to. Uh, talk a bit about the local area where life Lundstein came from and uh, so that we uh, create a bit of context of where he came from and how such a uh, ordinary person became one of the most experienced Spitfire pilots that no one knows yeah. about. Yes, exactly, which is, you know, very fascinating. And in considering everyone's, you know, in relation to uh, anyone where I come from, uh, I counted down six generations from Leif, and uh, I'm related to him. So I take oh, yes. anything. <laughs> I can uh, take it. I take that. <laughs> you have to make a revision, a republishing of Spitfire yeah. Glory, <laughs> where you are from related. Back in the 1600s. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Okay. Well, we better we better end this now, Kurt. Um, I'm. Yes. We will be uh, uploading this. Uh, in time of 9th of April. So by 9th of April, uh, maybe on 9th of April, uh, this will be available to all of you. So hope you enjoyed it. Uh, We enjoyed it. And we will do more. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again soon. See you. Bye bye.